Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to C++ Now, also from my side. I've been here three times at this conference. It's the second time that I start this conference with a session on Monday morning. So I feel like I have to welcome you, too. And I have to start a bit slowly to put your brains to conference mode. You just have been to the keynote, but we're going to see a lot more C++ code now. So yeah, I try to start slowly, still early, still the first day of the conference. Before I start to say anything about the presentation, there's one thing I don't know whether John forgot to mention, given that we ha are here in the mountains, the altitude. I don't know whether you want to say something about it, John, given that there are a lot of people here for the first time. If you have some headache, I was reminded to drink a lot. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so it's important if, if, yeah, if you have a little bit of headache, it's just because of the altitude here, and you will get used to it. So yeah, don't forget to drink a lot. As I said, um, for me, it's the third time in a row here, um, the, the second time that I start to present something here on the Monday morning. I was standing here, not in this room, but in another room a year ago, giving a presentation which was called 50 Boost Libraries in 180 Minutes. Maybe some people have been here and remembered. Um, some people were asking me whether I can maybe then talk this year about 100 Boost Libraries in 90 Minutes. I was considering this, but then I was thinking there will be people expecting me to talk about 200 booth libraries in 45 minutes next year. That is impossible simply because we don't have that many booth libraries. So that's the only reason, of course, why I can't do this. So I was trying to find another topic for today's presentation. And I was looking at the booth libraries, trying to find a subset of booth libraries, which I think can be useful for many, many people and in many, many applications. And I picked containers and boost. I think I don't need to explain what containers are. We all know what they are. We all use them. I don't need to convince anybody why containers are useful. So it's always good to have more choice to know more containers. And we will see we have a couple of container libraries in Boost. And in the next 90 minutes, I'm going to walk you through a couple of these libraries. Specifically, I'm trying to answer the questions, what containers has Boost to offer? How do they differ from containers you know from the standard library? How do you know which of these containers you should use? How do you use them? And last but not least, where do you find more information? Before I start talking about containers, given that there are a lot of people here for the first time at this conference, let me introduce myself quickly. My name is Boris Schelling. I'm from Germany. I live in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I work for a company in finance, a so-called prop trader. I work there as a C++ developer, so I deal with C++ code every day. The company called Optiver is also a sponsor of this year's conference. All my presentations so far in the past and also the one today have always been about Boost, as I consider myself being a member of the Boost community for quite some time. So I've been doing a couple of things there. Uh, one of the things which I just talked about with the guy here in the front, uh, I wrote a book on the Boost libraries, which is available in English and German. I've been working on a, li on a library called Boost Process for many, many years. Those people who know about Boost Process, they probably will understand if I'm not going to say anything else about this. It's a never-ending story. And another, year, uh, another thing I'm doing this year is that I'm the Google Summer of Code Administrator for Boost after Andrew did it for many, many years before. All right, back to the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'm trying not to forget to repeat the question. And let's jump into the first slide. So what I did for this presentation, I went to the Boost documentation, and we have a long list of libraries listed on our website. I was trying to find out which of these libraries actually count as container libraries. This is really a first attempt, so I just went through that and came up with these 15 libraries. But it depends very much on how you count. And maybe you see some libraries here, but you don't know why I put them on this slide. Maybe you know the mother Boost libraries, which you would expect to see here on this slide. So after I created my first list, I thought I have to define a container somehow, that we somehow agree on something at least, or that I can at least explain for this presentation what I mean with a container library. So the, de the definition I came up with does not necessarily match the definition you find in the standard library. It was just something for me, so I can define container somehow for this presentation. And I started with that containers can store multiple elements and they provide a way to access them. If you think of the containers you normally use, vector, list, set, and whatever, yeah, it matches perfectly. But it's, of course, a very naive and simple 
definition. There's a lot of other stuff which could fall under this definition too. So I went ahead and said the main purpose of the container libraries I'm going to introduce to you should be to manage elements. And I was trying to exclude here some libraries already at this point, like Boost Graph or Boost Signals, for example. If you know Boost Graph, you can define graphs in that library. You can add vertices and edges to a container. And then you can use algorithms on this container. But if you use Boost Graph, your intention is not really to manage elements somehow, as you would do with a vector or a list. This is really about the algorithms you find in Boost Graph. So I'm not going to talk about Boost Graph in this presentation. There's another session on Thursday if you really want to hear and learn something about Boost Graph, but Boost Graph is off topic for today. I also excluded Boost Signals at this point. If you know that library, there's a signal class inside. You can connect functions with that signal class. So to a certain extent, a signal can store a bunch of connections. But again, that is not really the kind of container library I want to look at. I also want to look at specifically at general purpose libraries, uh, container libraries, um, container libraries which are hopefully useful to all of you. Um, at this point, I'm, I'm excluding the ICL. ICL stands for Interval Container Library. There's even the word container in the library name. Yet I'm not going to talk about this one because these containers are really for intervals only. And if you have never used any intervals and have never any need to use intervals, that library is not something you might be interested in. So I'm excluding this library at this point too. I'm also interested mainly in libraries which define classes, not concepts. I want to use classes immediately. I don't want to read anything about concepts and then define classes myself. So it's all again about being useful as fast as possible. It should be easy to use the container libraries I'm going to introduce to you. So at this point, I have been excluding Boost Property Map. And last but not least, I'm looking only at containers which store homogeneous elements. If you think of tuples, for example, to a certain extent, a tuple is also a container. There are a couple of values in a tuple, and you can access them. So you might think of a tuple as a container too, but this is not something I'm going to look at. Again, I think there's on Thursday another presentation on tuples only. Um, you, your question was by concepts? Yes. Um, I'm not sure what you mean now with the differentiation. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. So the question was whether it's the idea of concepts as we are working on in the C++ community and which might be added to the C++ standard one day or the concepts as defined in uh, the C++ standard as of today. Ah, okay, understand. So the idea at this point is not to talk about the concept as a language feature. It's more like looking at a documentation which describes some concept in the documentation. And then you want to use a library, but you don't have any classes, anything to instantiate. So I was not looking at a library like Boost Property Map at this point, which is merely a documentation, uh, which defines concept in a documentation. So after trying to define container library somehow for myself, I went back to my first slide and looked at my list again. And I came up now with the, with the following 13 libraries, which I'm going to talk about. And I wanted to order them somehow. I didn't want to go through them by alphabet. So what you see here is even more subjective than the first slide. So I put these libraries into an order. And I'm going to talk about boost multi-index first. So if there's a fire now in five minutes and we have to evacuate the building, I at least want you to know boost multi-index. Then we are going to look at boost bimap next, which is a bit related to boost multi-index. Its implementation is based on boost multi-index. We're looking at a library called container doesn't tell us much what container is about, but we will see later when we get to that point. Intrusive is an interesting library because all the other libraries which you see here, when you use the containers from the libraries, and you put elements into the container, and the container goes out of scope, all the elements are automatically destroyed. And for intrusive, it's different. 
So you put elements into a container, the container goes out of scope, but the elements still exist. We will see how this works when we come to Boost Intrusive. Then we have a pointer container library um, where you can easily put in pointers to dynamically allocated objects. Rather convenient to use that library if you have, yeah, as I said, dynamically allocated objects. You have a circular buffer library, just a ring buffer. You have a library called Logfree, which is interesting if you want to use some containers in a multi-threaded application. It's really the only library here on this slide which you can use uh, in a multi-threaded application without thinking of logs or synchronizing access yourself. We have Boost Property Tree. Maintainer is sitting here, I think, Sebastian. Um, Property Tree is also a very convenient library, um, mainly to somehow manage configuration data. We have Dynamic Bit Set, which is very similar to the Bit Set class in the C++ standard, except that this one is dynamic, which means you can set the number of bits at runtime, not at compile time. Multi-array, a class to use multi-dimensional arrays. Heap is a, is a library uh, which provides a couple of priority queues for you. And array and unordered, they are at the end of the list, not because they are unimportant, but we have them already in C++11. And if we get to these libraries, I'm just going to highlight differences between what we have in C++11 and in Boost. Otherwise, I'm afraid I'm going to bore you. And it's another reason why I'm not going through it by alphabet. Otherwise, we would need to start with Boost Array now. So let's jump into the first library. I want to start with multi-index because I believe that is really a very, very useful library which I use all the time. And the idea of that uh, library is that you can create containers which provide multiple interfaces or multiple indexes. That's where the name of the library comes from. And what that means is that if you use a container from the standard library, you have to pick one of many. So if you want to make sure that you control the sequence of elements, then you take a list because you can yeah, control yourself where you insert and erase elements. And if you need another group of elements which should be sorted by default, you take a set. But you have to take one or the other. But maybe you have an application where sometimes you want to look at your elements as a sorted sequence and sometimes you want to look at the elements as a sequence where you control in which order they are. And at this point, you can do, of course, you could take a list and a set from the standard library and then put a copy of the elements into both containers and then make sure that you always synchronize the containers. So when you remove an element from one container, you also remove it from the other container. When you insert an element in one container, you insert in, in, it into the other container. So that is a lot of work, can go easily wrong. And it's also not very expressive if you, if you look at the C++ code. What you can do instead, you can turn to Boost Multi-Index. You can use a container here from this library, which allows you, when you access the container, to pick one of the multiple interfaces the multi-index container supports. So you can stuff a couple of elements into a multi-index container. When you access then the container, you decide at this point, do you want to access the container as a list? or you want to look at the container as a set. So that's the idea of this library. And the library can also be useful in other scenarios. Um, that is the second item I put down here. If you think of a map and you want to look up something and you have a, a, a concept in mind, or maybe I shouldn't use the word concept anymore, you have, a, you have an idea in mind, a, a certain thing like an animal. It is an example you will see on the coming slides, so I'm using it now already and you want to look up an animal by the number of legs. You define a map, and the key is an int, the number of legs, and the value is a string, the name of the animal. But then in, in your code, you have only a map and a key and value pair. You don't have a class animal anymore with properties like name and legs, which would be just more convenient to have. It would be more expressive in the code to have just a class animal, especially if later you find out you would need to add a third property which you can't do anymore if you just have a map. Also at this point you can turn to boost multi-index. We will see in the next slides where I have some source code examples for you. You can then use your class animal. You can define 
um, the animal with a couple of properties like number of legs and a name. And then you can use that class in the multi-index container just as you would normally do if you were using a map. So that's the idea of the boost multi-index container. If you want to use it, here are the header files, and that is the namespace. Now for every library, I'm going to introduce, I have here some quick facts for you. So that is a container you find only in Boost. It doesn't exist yet in the C++ standard library. I'm not sure whether anybody's working on maybe adding it to the standard library one day. The containers here from Boost Multi-Index, they are not fixed size, so you can add and erase elements. The containers from Boost Multi-Index, they own element. If a container goes out of scope, all the elements are gone. Boost multi-index is not threat safe. What's also interesting, if you insert or erase elements in a multi-index container, you have at this point iterators or references to other elements in the container. They remain valid. The boost multi-index container can be serialized with boost serialization. And you can also put a boost multi-index container into shared memory if you use boost interprocess. You also see that this container is around for quite some time. So I don't know which Boost version you maybe use already in your organization, but as it is around since Boost 132, it's very likely that you have then access to it. Now let's look at a couple of um, slides with source code to have an idea how we would use now the multi-index container actually. So here's my class animal. Um, the animal class is defined as having a name, which is just a string. It's a public member. The animal has a number of legs. The legs is a private property, but there's a friend function defined. And for my animal, I have also a bool variable called dangerous. And for that one, I used a public member function to find out whether an animal is dangerous or not. And there's an appropriate constructor, though I can easily set these member variables somehow. Now I want to use this animal class in a multi-index container to look up animals by name, by the number of legs, and also whether they are dangerous or not. The first thing I have to do when I use uh, the library boost multi-index is I have to define a type first. I have to define my own container. So it's not that there's a class which you can instantiate directly. Instead, we have now defined our own container for our animals. And we have to do this because we have to decide at this point what kind of interfaces we need in the end. Do we need to look at this container as being a list? Do we want this container yeah, looking like a set? At this point, we define how our multi-index container looks like. What I do at this point, I access the class multi-index container. The first template parameter I pass here is animal. That is the class I just defined. That is the element I want to put into the container. The next template parameter is called index by. You always write this at this point, index by. And then you write down a list of interfaces you want to use for this container. And in this case, I use three different interfaces, hashed unique, hashed non-unique, and ordered non-unique. And for each interface, I have to specify how that interface should actually look up elements in that container. So for the first interface, hash unique, I say, my animal should be looked up by its name. You have then to write down here the type animal again. You have to write down also the type of the name. In this case, it's standard string. You have to specify the name of the member variable. In this case, it's again name. You have to wrap the whole thing here in something called member because name is a member variable of the animal. And I want the names to be unique and I want them to be looked up by a hash value. So if I have later that container instantiated and I put in animals into that container, I can easily look up animals by their name. But I also want to be able to look up animals by whether they are dangerous or not. Now dangerous is another member in that animal class. It's not a member variable though, it's a member function. It's a const member function. So all of these types are provided by boost multi-index. 
So this, uh, this time I say the second interface, hashed non-unique, should look up animals by the, um, by the property dangerous, and it should be done by accessing the const member function called dangerous, which returns a bool. The question is whether I covered the case um, where I can pass a parameter to the dangerous function. And uh, I believe that, well, actually, I'm not covering the case. There, is, there are a couple of these um, interfaces. And there's one where you can indeed define your own key extractor, which can then combine a couple of member variables. But uh, I think what you are asking about is something I'm not going to cover. Yeah. So I really try to keep it simple as we don't have 50 libraries to talk about, but still enough for 90 minutes. Yeah. Um, at this point, the interface is non-unique, and it is non-unique because later if I put animals into the container, there could be a couple of animals which are dangerous, and I still want to put them all into. So if the interface is unique, and I'm trying to put in another animal with the same name, which exists already in the container, I can't add it. So in this case, I said, okay, I still want to be able to put in several animals which are dangerous. So that's the reason why that interface is called hashed non-unique. And the third interface I have added here is called ordered non-unique. So the difference is now that in this, this case, all the animals are ordered. So while here, I just look up animals by the hash value. And for ordered non-unique, I said, I want the animals to be ordered according to their legs. And legs is now it's that friend function, so it's a global function. So I need to use another type here again called global fun. And I'm saying, okay, this index should look up animals by calling that global function legs. Legs returns an int and um, gets a parameter called, oh no, was it the other way around? Let me check. Oh no, yeah, it returns an int and it gets a parameter const animal reference. So at this point, I have to define my container, and I think that is normally the step which is a bit more complicated because you have to look at all these types and you have to nest them all somehow. But once it's done, you have a new type defined, in this case called animals type. It is now a new container which you can instantiate. Then you can put um, animals into that container. You can access then three different interfaces to look up animals somehow. Now we're going to see this here now. So my um, container animals type is instantiated. I have now a new object called animals. I'm going to insert animals by calling the member function insert. So I'm inserting here a lion. Lion is dangerous, has four legs. A cat, cat is not dangerous, but has also four legs. And a shark, also dangerous, but doesn't have any legs. Now I want to look up animals somehow. And what I can do, I can just access the object animals and call a member function like find. And if I do that, if I don't specify explicitly which interface I want to use, at this point automatically the first interface is used. So the first interface is that one which you have to find here. Hashed unique, which is looking up animals by its name. So at this point I'm saying, okay, I want to find the line. And then I get my iterator here and I can just access the animal through that iterator and can, for example, find out whether the line is dangerous or not. As you will see for this presentation, there's a little bit of C++11 used, but not that much. I use the auto keyword here and there. There are some lambda functions, otherwise not much C++11 used. I can also count the animals like the lines, for example. And uh, in this case, I get just one. I can also explicitly access an index, and that is, of course, important if you want to use a container like this one. So I want, for example, to, yes, there's a question. Uh, you said it, it used the first defined index. Are you saying that it always uses the first if you don't know it, or was it smart enough to figure out The question was whether always the first index is used if I don't explicitly specify it. And yes, it always starts the first. So if I try to look up something differently here now, not by using a string, then it wouldn't compile. Yeah. So if I want to use another index, I have to explicitly access the other index somehow. And I do this by calling the function get. 
and I pass just the index of the index, the template parameter. So in this case, we have three different indexes. And I'm saying I want now to look up somehow animals by the number of legs, and I have to find an interface, an index for the number of legs, which is the third one in my container definition. So I pass here the parameter 2, and I get now here my index to access the animal somehow by the number of legs. If I go two slides back, the third index here with the legs was an ordered index. So I can now somehow look up animals by using the member function lower, lower bound and upper bound. So I can find all the animals which have legs between yeah, two and four legs. Then I can use, for example, here for each loop to iterate over my animals found and print them. So in this case, I find, of course, the lion and the cat. They have four legs, but I don't find the shark. What I can also do, there are a couple of helpful functions provided. I can also project an iterator from one index to another. So if I have now here my begin index, uh, my begin iterator, which is an iterator for the lag index, I can easily project it to a name iterator or to a dangerous iterator. So an iterator for a certain interface can be easily mapped to an iterator for another interface can be handy if you need then to use the iterator with another function which belongs to another interface. What else you can do? I'm just going through a couple of helpful functions. You can also get the iterator from an element. So here I'm looking up the line again. Then I have here reference to my line animal. If I pass this animal to the iterator2 function, I get the iterator from that element directly. What is very important to know when you use boost multi-index, that even if you have an iterator which is not const, that you cannot change an element in the multi-index container through that iterator. So no matter whether your iterator is const or not const, you cannot change an element because the reason is that if you have an element in a container, a couple of properties of this element might be used by various indexes. If you change now suddenly a property of an animal, how do the indexes of the container know that they have, for example, to rehash something or they have to sort again the elements? So what you have to do here, if you want to change something in a multi-index container, you have to call a function um, modify. And you pass then the iterator to the modify function. And then here I use the lambda function. So that lambda function is then called. You get your reference to that animal at this position in the container. And then you can change the animal in the lambda function. When the lambda function returns, all of this happens within the modify function of the container. The container has a chance to make sure that all the indexes can maybe be updated. There's another function called modify key. So there you only change the key. What you also could do, and what I've also seen in a lot of code, you could, of course, also cast the const away and access a member variable directly. Very dangerous, especially if you make a mistake here and you change a member variable, which is used somewhere by an index. But sometimes you have a class defined where you as a developer know, well, there are a couple of member variables, and I know they don't belong to an index. I would like to change them, and I just cast the const away and access them directly. Yes. Um, the question is whether you can find an animal by, by calling find. Uh, here, at this point? Yes. No, you can't. Yeah. So the first thing you always do when you access a multi-index container, you look at which interface you need. And you get then the interface like this. The only exception is if you need to use the first interface, then you can just call functions directly. And then you have the interface, and the interface behaves like a container of its own, and then you can call the member functions of that interface. Yes? Yes, that's a good question. What happens if you modify now here the name, and suddenly, what is it here? Suddenly the line is also called cat, 
which isn't allowed because I have to find my multi-index container in a way that each and every animal must have a unique name. So what happens here if you try to modify um, an element and you invalidate one of the indexes? It doesn't even need to be the index where you use the name. It can also be another index where you use the legs or the dangerous uh, variable. If you modify an animal here and you invalidate one of the indexes, the element is erased. It's gone. So there's no exception thrown. Suddenly the element is gone. So one has to be a bit careful. Yeah. Oh, yeah, next question. Yes. Yeah, the question is what happens if you are going to change a member variable of the animal, for example, which isn't used in any index? Then indeed, it is perfectly valid to cast the const away and just to write the value directly. As I said, I've seen developers doing this just for yeah, convenience or if you don't have, for whatever reason, not yet C available. And um, you can write this. In this case, it's of course not allowed because that name variable is used in an index. But if there were the force variable in the, in the animal class, which isn't used in any index here, you could just access that variable like this and write it, and it would be perfectly fine. Is way to do it, well, I, I, I think it's better if I don't say, especially now if this is all recorded, that this is a preferred way. <laughs> so if possible, I would probably use the modifier, modi modified key function. Well, in, in this case, it, there could be a performance hit because this container when you call modify, has to assume that you maybe changed something in the animal class or the animal object which invalidated an, an interface. So it might need to go through the indexes and has to check, well, what did you change actually? Do I need to rehash values or do I need to sort the animals again if you change the number of legs? So while you do that here, the animals container doesn't even know that you changed something in an animal object. Sebastian, you had also a yeah. question? Okay. There's last but not least another function I want to mention, replace. Yeah, replace does just what the name suggests. It replaces um, one object with another. So in this case, I would replace my line, or in this case, it is called tiger, with another animal called cup. And again, if the animal which I'm trying to add here doesn't fit into the container because you would invalidate an index again, because there is already maybe another animal called cup, then the replacement fails. So the one element is erased, but the new element isn't added. Yeah, the question is, what is the uh, rationale behind all of this? And I have to forward that question to the uh, maintainer of the library. Um, it is something which is really hidden in the documentation. So I wrote it down here because otherwise it is not clear. You maybe call that function and something happens and you have no idea what happened. There's no exception thrown. And um, yeah, I'm trying to highlight it here. Otherwise, I really need to forward the question. Maybe somebody knows or has an idea. Yes. Um, modify and replace. I don't remember now off by heart whether they have a return value. The question is whether these two functions have return values. Does anyone remember? I don't remember now. I don't think they have. Yeah. Did you have another question, Sebastian? Or? Um, uh, I have an idea why you wait as long. Because, I mean, modify, the, 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 the function you have to modify gets passed not to the right thing. And that is the object that is actually in the container at this point. Yeah. So if you modify it, and then it doesn't fit into the container anymore, it actually can't roll back the chain. That reminds me of something else. Um, I think the modify function has also another signature where you can pass a third uh, argument, which is a rollback function. So that function is then called if the modification fails. You can fix the problem yourself. You can roll back then the element yourself. Yeah. Well, that was boost multi-index. No fire, so we can continue with the next library. So let's have a look at boost biomap. 
um, I guess their name says it already, what that library is about. In this library, you find a, contain, uh, you find a map. And you can now look up items in that map, not only from the one side, but also from the other side. So when you think of a map, you normally have on the one side a key and on the other side a value. If you take a by map, you can also use the value as a key and then treat the key as a value. What you can also do, you can also iterate over pair relations in a by map. So you do not necessarily look at a map from the left and from the right, but you can look at a couple of pairs and then you can iterate over them. And how this works, we are going to have a check again when we come to the slides. Okay, so Sebastian looked it up, modify, returns a boo, which hopefully tells us whether the modification was successful or not. There are the header files again. There is not one header file, there are a couple of header files, and the namespace is booth by maps. Here are the quick facts. The booth only library, which you don't find in the C standard. It's not fixed size, it owns the elements again, it's not thread safe. Validity of iterators and references is preserved. So when you raise and insert something, all these iterators and references to other elements remain valid. Um, the container can be serialized with boost serialization. And I couldn't find anything about boost interprocess, even though boost biomap is actually implemented based on boost multi-index. And boost multi-index clearly says that you can use the container in a shared memory with boost interprocess. So I'm not sure what the um, situation is here about boost by map. And the library is also around since 135, so for quite some time. So how does this work now? At this point, you don't need to uh, define your container first. You can access the by map container directly and instantiate the container to have an object to work with. So just like with other maps, you define yeah, a key and a value, except that you can also turn it the other way around. So in this case, I want to look up animals again by the name and by the legs. I want to look up animals sometimes by the name and sometimes by the leg. That's why using a by map, so I can decide when I exit the container from which side I want to look at the uh, pairs. Then I insert my animals here into the container, a lion and a cat. And then when I exit the container to look up somehow elements, I have to decide at this point do I look at the map from the left side or do I look at the map from the right side? And from the left side means I'm looking up elements by the string, by the name. And from the right side I'm looking up animals by the number of legs. When I look up here my line, I count obviously one line. When I look up the animals by the number of legs, what does count return? Count returns in this case one. What the reason? By default, all these keys, again, both sides are really keys in a by map, have to be unique. So when I was trying here to insert my cat with four legs, the container found out, whoa, there is already another animal with four legs, so I can't add the cat here at this point. So when I use a by map like this, everything has to be unique, which matches what we know from the C++ standard library. We have also there a map, a multi-map. We will see it's also possible to use a by map in a way that we can store yeah, multiple elements with the same number of legs. We will see this on the next slide. The last thing which I want to mention at this point is we cannot only access elements from the left and from the right. We cannot only treat the container as a map, but we can also iterate over the pairs in the container. So here at this point I get an iterator to the beginning of my animals, and then I can look at the left and at the right side of the iterator to get the name and the number of legs of my animals. So there are third ways how I can access the data in that by map, left side, right side, or number of pairs. Now here I see, uh, here I show you a couple of other um, yeah, possibilities how we can define our by map. By default, we actually just pass a type for the two keys. But what we can also do, we can specify here yeah, some kind of containers again. So what you see here in the second row is 
that I define my animals type 2 container as being a set of strings and a set of ints. And that line here is exactly the same as what I was writing down here in the first line. So by default, if I just use the type for my keys, it means it's a set of strings and a set of ints. That implies everything has to be unique. Now if I want now to be if I want now to be able to store animals, and these animals should also be able to have the same number of legs, I can use here on the right side instead of set of a multi set of. So if you use boost by map, you don't have two classes like in the C standard library with map and multi map. There's not a by map and a multi by map. Instead you specify here the types for the both sides individually. So for the animals type 3 thing, the name still must be unique, but the number of legs don't need to be unique anymore. I can also say that I want to look up animals on the right side by the number of legs, the hash value. So in this case, um, the animals are not sorted anymore according to their number of legs I use here an unordered multi set of int. Now I can even use something which is called unconstrained set of int, which means that I have disabled the right side. So in this case, this by map works exactly like a standard map from the C standard library. So I can access the animals only by the name, not by the number of legs. That can be useful if you want to use certain functions by map provides you, but you don't find in standard map in the C standard like modify or replace again. As I said, boost by map is based on boost multi-index. There are a couple of functions in boost multi-index which are not in standard map in the C++ standard. And that might be a reason why you want to define a class like this sometimes. What you can also do, I said, you cannot only access animals from the left and from the right side. You can also iterate somehow over the and relations. You can also pass here a third uh, type and you can define how these relations should be actually stored in the container. Last but not least, you can even attach some extra information with the uh, pairs here in that container. And I've done this here. In this, say, in this case, I say, all right, I want to store again my animals, name, number of legs, and something else. And I can add something which is called with info. I pass the type of what else I want to store here with an animal. When I insert then the animal here, my line with the four legs, I have added there a third parameter called raw. And that parameter, that value is now also stored with the line here in my animals container. Can with info have several other values? Uh, like strings, number, like strings. The question is whether with info can have several parameters and no. So you would need to define your own class here if you want to add some more data apart from the string. Here you see how you look up then the line again and here how you access that extra information. So there's simply a member variable called info and info corresponds now here in this case to that string raw. Here we find our replace and modify functions again which we have met already when we were looking at boost multi-index. And they work exactly like in multi-index. So you have to be careful again that if you modify an animal and the modification fails because you invalidated then an index again, then the, er uh, the element is again erased. Oops. You can again project iterators. If you have an iterator to one side, you can project it to another side. You can even project it up to an iterator for the relations. And what is maybe also interesting, if you um, don't like to use the member functions lower bound and upper bound, but you still want to find certain animals um, which have um, at least, for example, two legs and maximum four legs, you can use something like this. Looks a bit funny, but it's actually, I think, easier to understand than having to call the functions lower bound and upper bound. There's a function called range then you can pass in something like two smaller equals key and key smaller equals four. And then range will return a pair to iterators 
to the range of animals which have two or three or four legs. Next library I want to talk about is Boost Container. In that library you find a lot of containers which you know already from the C++ standard library. So a lot of containers are here defined um, which you have access to already anyway. So you might wonder why you want to use then the containers from that library. There are some um, extra guarantees here from the containers in this library. For example, you can use your containers recursively. You will see in two slides what that means. There are also some new containers provided which you don't find otherwise in the C++ standard library. There's, for example, stable vector. There's a flat set and a flat map. And there's an S list, S list for singly linked list. A stable vector is a vector where you can insert and erase elements and the references and iterators to the other elements in that stable vector, they remain valid. In a flat set, in a flat map, you can think of these are simply vectors which are always sorted. So you don't have a tree structure, you just have a vector. Whenever you add or erase an element, there's an automatic call to a sort function. So it's a, yeah, again, flat container. That's why the container is called flat set and flat map. And um, it's an always sorted one. There's also a standard string class provided, or I shouldn't say standard string class. It's a class called string in that boost container library. And there's also an extra guarantee, like a small string optimization. So if you want to use something which um, works the same on a multiple of platforms, you could use the boost container library and you don't need to use the standard string implementation from whatever library you just have access to on a certain platform. So these extra guarantees are maybe a reason why you want to use containers from Boost Container. There are a lot of header files. You have to pick the one depending on which container you want to use. And all the classes from Boost Container are defined in the namespace Boost Container. Fact sheets again. Well, it's not boost only because most of the containers you find in the standard library anyway. Fixed size neither. Yes, these containers own elements. They are not thread safe. Just like with the containers in the standard library, iterators and references are typically invalidated. And you can't serialize this container with boost serialization. What I mean is that you maybe find out somehow a way that you can serialize them but there's nothing in the documentation which clearly says, yes, just use that function and it works. But there's some reference in that documentation that you can use the boost containers without any problems in shared memory. So they are compatible with boost interprocess. You see that that library is pretty new, only around since 148. So you might need to upgrade your boost version depending on what you use. And just to give you an idea what you can now use here, what you can now benefit from this boost container, this is here a recursive container. So I have my animal class again. An animal has a name. And an animal might have children. And I can at this point use the vector container from boost container. And that vector will have, again, animals again. So it looks a bit strange because at this point, yeah, animal is not yet completely defined but boost container guarantees that you can write this code and that this works. So this compiles. Here you have also the stable vector. I explain here again, there's this reference, what it does, it, or actually what it doesn't. It doesn't invalidate iterators and references if you insert or raise animals. And you have a flat set. Yeah, just think of it as a sorted vector. Otherwise, these containers are rather simple to use. Sorry. Pardon? I uh, didn't understand. Can you insert in the middle a stable vector? Um, um, the question is whether I can insert in the middle. I, I don't know now. I, there is no other example anymore either, so I have to, at this point to refer to the documentation. I, th I think you had something in mind, right? I said something wrong. Or I can't imagine how you could guarantee not to invalidate iterators. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, what happens here, what this, oh, you wanted to say something, Sebastian? Yes, I, I just wanted to write it down. What this stable vector real looks like, something like this. So you have here a couple of uh, pointers, and you have here your object. Oops, and there's maybe another one. And um, that, is, that is the implementation of the stable vector. So if you add another object somewhere, I don't know, maybe you're here at the end, you might need to reallocate the whole thing. But the other object, as they are not part of the vector itself, they are still around in memory. Maybe at this point, yeah, I refer to the documentation. Sebastian said there's the very same picture in the documentation to understand how this really works. Yeah. So I think the idea is that when we think of a vector, we think here of a block of data. But in this case, we also have a block of data, but it's really pointers to objects. So this is the vector, but the object itself, the animals we insert into the vector, they are somewhere else stored in memory. Could be, yes, yeah. So, yeah, that's just the name of the container at this point, yeah. Now let's go to the next library, Boost Intrusive. The library is interesting because it provides containers which, when they go out of scope, don't destroy the elements. So what you do here, when you insert an element into an intrusive container, you don't add a copy to the container, but you store the original element in an intrusive container. That also means that the lifetime of elements must be managed by you, by the user. Which also means that libraries are a bit more complicated, so most of the time you probably prefer just to use a container like vector or list or multi-index, where you just know you just put everything into the container, the container knows itself what to do, you don't need to take care of the elements yourself. So in this case, if you use an intrusive container, and you add an element to the container, there is no copy made. The original element is added to the container. That also means you have to make sure that the original, original element stays around as long as the container stays around. It also means that you must set up the types for that intrusive container specifically. So if you have an intrusive list and you want to add a, an, an object to the list, you would expect that this object has a pointer to the next element in the list and to the previous element in the list. And if you use now, or if you want now to store an object into an int in an intrusive list, you must add these pointers to your own object yourself. So there's a lot of extra work required if you want to use intrusive containers. But there are a lot of containers provided by that library. So there are actually more, more containers provided that you find in the standard library. And there are some special ones, special tree containers. So if you are very much interested in performance and you want to uh, avoid that any copies are made when you add elements to the container, when you want to avoid that there's any dynamic memory allocation done, then you can use an intrusive container. Otherwise, it's probably not much worse either to um, go through all the trouble and set up the types yourself. Yes? Yeah, the question is whether the objects have to provide their own meets, means to be able to be used in these containers. Like the yes, absolutely. The the yes. That is correct. So if you want to use, for example, standard string in an intrusive container, it won't work. Because standard string doesn't have anything which will make it possible to use standard string in an intrusive container you want to use a standard string in an intrusive list, the intrusive list expects that standard string has two member variables where pointers can be stored to the next and to the previous element. So that's the reason why I wrote here types must be set up to be used in containers. You can't just use your um, animal class, the one I defined before, and put it into an intrusive container as is. You need to change your class a little bit to make it possible to store animals in an intrusive container. Yes, 
that is true. Yeah, though, yes, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's an interface adapter, but the, the functions you call are still called then insert and erase. So, yeah, it can be indeed a bit misleading. Again, this booth intrusive is a booth only library, no fixed size containers. The most important um, thing here is that it does not own elements, elements and the containers are separated, different lifetime. It is not thread safe. Validities of iterators and references is preserved, which is maybe obvious given that the elements are not really copied into the container, but they are somewhere staying around in memory anyway. Boost intrusive cannot be serialized with boost serialization and cannot be put into shared memory with boost interprocess. And the container library is around since boost 135. So how does this work now in code? How do we put now an animal into an intrusive container? Now I have, I have my animal class here again. And as I said, I need to set up my type now somehow that I can put it into an intrusive container. And it depends now also on the container how I need to set up my type. So I just gave the example that if I want to use a list, I probably need two pointers to the next and to the previous element. But if I want to use another container, there are maybe other member variables required. So at this point, I have already to make a decision in which intrusive container I want to store my animals later. And this animal I want to store in a list. So I derive it from a class called list base hook, a class provided by Boost Intrusive. And that class adds the required member variables to my animal. In this case, very, li very likely to member variables for the two pointers. Then I have my type set up. I can then define my list based here on this animal class. So I have my animal list now. Then I can instantiate my animal list. I can create my line. And then I add the line to that container. And what happens at this point, there is no copy created. There is no copy made of this line and added to animals. What animals pushback does is it just sets up these two pointers, which are very likely got from list base hook. It just set up these two pointers somehow in a way that this list now has one element. Instead of using the list base hook, which is a parent class. I can also use a hook as a member, a member um, property. So it's here a list member hook. In this case, I need to define my um, animal list a little bit differently. So I need to define an animal member hook now. It's a bit more complicated, but I just need to pass in here the required types. And at the end, I get again my animal list. So whether you use the um, hook as a base class or whether you use the hook the member here doesn't really matter. It just comes down to what you prefer. Yeah, the question was where I specify that I'm using the intrusive container. Um, I don't use the um, boost intrusive namespace here anywhere. So this is now not the list from the standard library. This is my list type from boost intrusive. So otherwise, I would have needed a bigger screen. Now, if I add elements to an intrusive container, I have to be very careful about um, the lifetime of the object. So I have to make sure that I don't erase an element too early if I have a container which has stored actually the element somehow. So if I remove element, I have to be careful. There are a couple of functions provided to remove elements. One is simply called remove if. So in this case, if I call remove if, there's a predicate used and I want to remove all animals um, which are lines. So in this case, I have just one line. I push it back. In this case, it is removed again. There's nothing destroyed here at this point. The animal list is, of course, still around. And my animal object here, the line, is also still around. It's just that it is not part of the list anymore. If I really want to destroy the object, when I remove it from the container, I can call another function, which is called remove and dispose if. So here I create an animal again, my line. It's dynamically created with new. I add it to my intrusive container animals. 
And then I want to remove the animal again, but at the same time I want also to destroy it. Otherwise I leak some memory here. And that works by passing here the predicate again. Is it a line? And if it is a line, then please call this lambda function where I get a pointer to that element and where I destroy the animal then. So there's remove if, there's remove and dispose if. There are, of course, many, many other ways how you can manage your elements. The most important thing is always to make sure that whatever you store here in, a, in an intrusive container, that you don't forget about it and that you don't suddenly here um, yeah, destroy or that this object goes out of scope and here this container still believes that it is actually a member of it. There's also a so-called auto-unlink mode. So you can set up your type somehow that if the objects are removed from your intrusive container, that they are automatically destroyed. So here I have my animal again. And in this case, I have used again the base hook. And I pass here a parameter called link mode. There are three different link modes supported by the library. And I can pass here a type called auto unlink. And that means that when an animal is removed from my list, that the animal is automatically destroyed. Ah, yes, yeah. So Sebastian corrected me. If the animal is destroyed, it is automatically removed from the list. And let me just look at the source code whether that is correct. So I have here my animal. I push it back into my container. And then I destroy the object. And at this point, the container is automatically updated. As the element doesn't exist anymore, the container knows, uh, the container knows it shouldn't assume that it is still part of it. Yes, thank you very much. If you want to set up a type in a way that you can use it in multiple intrusive containers, you could, of course, derive now from different base hooks. Or you could define a couple of member hooks. Or you can just use one hook, which is called any base hook. So in this case, I have set up my animal, and I can use it in a list, in a set, or in any of the other um, intrusive containers provided by that library. Huh? Yes. The question is whether that animal, when I create an instead of it, whether I can add this animal to multiple intrusive containers at the same time. And yes, that is true. That is correct. Yeah. That's really the idea of using that hook. Yeah. Let's go to the next container, which is called pointer container. That library provides SDL-like containers, which make it very easy to manage objects which have been created dynamically, which have been created with new. So these containers are a little bit similar to standard vector, standard unique pointer, which means that the pointer containers from that library, they own the objects. You cannot share the ownership of objects in the pointers containers with something else outside of the pointer containers. So when you add um, an object to the pointer container, the pointer container goes out of scope, the object is destroyed. What's also nice is that when you get iterators here to elements in a pointer container, the iterators point to the objects directly and not to the pointers. And that library also provides insert iterators. So there are just a couple of utilities to make it easy to work with um, containers which don't store objects but yeah, pointers to objects. Fact sheets again, boost only, yes. Fixed size, no. It owns elements, yes. It is not thread safe. Validity of iterators and references is not preserved. It can be serialized with boost serialization, cannot be put into shared memory with boost interprocess, and it's a very, very old library around for quite some time. Very easy to use. We have a couple of uh, classes which are all called pointer, underscore, and then vector, list, set, you name it. And here I use the pointer vector to store animals. I create some animals with new my line and my cat, and then I add the pointer directly with pushback to the container. 
The container is the sole owner of these objects, so when the container goes out of scope, my animals are automatically freed. Here's an example for an insert iterator. I can copy now the animals from that vector into that list. And if I really like to get ownership of an element from that container, I can do. I just need to call a release function. Then I get a pointer to an animal. And then it's my job to make sure that the object is properly destroyed when I don't need it anymore. So at this point, if I call pop front, the line now is owned by this unique pointer. And the line is not owned anymore by the list. Pop front is called here on the list. Rather simple library, so we can, I think, move a little bit faster now. Yes? Sure. Um, the question is whether the copy is a deep copy or it will only copy the pointers. Uh, the copy is a deep copy. Yes, yeah. We would have a problem if we had multiple pointer containers with pointers to the same objects, as each pointer container owns the object. So if there was one pointer container going out of scope and destroying the object, the other pointer container would still have pointers to objects which don't exist anymore. Yeah. Burst circular buffer, another simple to use library. It's a fixed size container, it's a ring buffer, so you can add elements to um, that uh, container and um, yeah, it just overrides elements. At some point the container is full, but if you add more elements, it uh, keeps on overriding them. Overriding is done through assignment. So there's no um, constructor called or destructor, it's just an assignment. The size of the buffer is set at runtime. And even though it's a ring buffer, it has begin and end iterators. So we can use all kind of um, algorithms on this container. It's boost only, yes, it's fixed size. Conceptually, yes, it's fixed size, but there's a way to change the size of a circular buffer at runtime if you really want to. It owns elements, yes, thread safe, no. Validity of iterators and references is not preserved. It cannot be serialized with boost serialization, but it can be put into shared memory and it can be shared with boost interprocess. And it's also around for quite some time since 135. How do I use now this container? Here I use my animal class again. I define a circular buffer which has a size of three. And then I add four animals to the container. No problem for that container at all. So what happens here is that the shark overrides the line. So there can be only three elements in the container. And yeah, that's the idea of a circular buffer. You just keep overriding animals. And if I call now here front, then I get the name of tiger because tiger is the new beginning of that container. And there are some other helpful functions like full and empty. And yeah, full just returns a boolean and tells me that the container is full. There are three elements inside and there can't be more inside. What you can also do, you can also look at the arrays in the circular buffer. Um, if, you, if you imagine that the circular buffer is maybe implemented based on a vector, you have uh, at the first index in the vector of the line, the next one the tiger, then the cat, and then the shark comes in, so the shark is now at the first position in the vector again, but the shark is really the end of the vector, and the tiger is now the first entry, uh, the, the shark is really the end of the circular buffer, and the uh, tiger is really the beginning of the circular buffer, so you have two arrays somehow in the circular buffer, you can access them directly with array 1 and array 2, you can also linearize the whole buffer by calling the linearize function, which makes sure that um, the beginning of the circular buffer is really at the lowest memory address. And everything is sequentially after another in memory in the circular buffer. Yeah, you have a couple of other functions. You can erase the first element. There's an erase function, but uh, you also find some um, optimizations here. You can also erase... Um, for example, here the first entry in the circular buffer, that is a function you can use for scalar types. So what happens here is that there's not the destructor called for each element, but um, here because it's for scalar types, the um, begin iterator is just added to another position in the circular buffer. 
later then when more elements are added, all these elements are overwritten again anyway. So there's no need to do anything else. But we have a couple of optimizations here in that circular buffer. Apart from that, there's not much more to say. Boost log free is a container library um, which can be useful in multi-threaded applications. The name implies it. These containers are log free. So you can now create a container and modify this container in multiple threads. All this works because it's implemented um, based on atomic operations. There's also support for fixed size containers, which is important because if, if the queue or the stack, which are provided by this library, are getting full and you add some more elements, they might allocate memory again. And then it's not necessarily log free anymore because yeah, memory is a shared resource shared by all processes on a machine. So you can define also your containers in a way that you say they should be fixed size. So there's no memory allocation done. If the containers are full, you call a function like push, it returns and says false, didn't work out. So there are a couple of ways to um, configure the containers. There are also containers um, optimized for multi and single producer consumer scenarios. So if you have a container which you need to access in multiple threads and it works fine with that library, if you have another container and you know you need to access, you need to access it in only one thread to add elements and there's another thread which reads elements, then there's also a special container for this. So there are a couple of containers optimized for different scenarios. The fact sheets, boost only, yes, fixed size. It depends, by default not, but you can configure the containers to be fixed size. The log-free containers own elements. They are thread safe. That's the uh, big advantage of this library. Validity of iterators and references is not preserved. They cannot be serialized and they can be used in shared memory. And brand new library, only around this 153. How does it look like now in code? So we have only three containers here really. That is the queue and the stack. So I use here the queue with my animals again. I reserve 100 slots in the queue. And then I have two threads. I don't really define the threads here. I'm just saying that this is a one thread and this is the other thread. And the one thread just pushes animals into that queue. So it's a millipede. And um, yeah, it starts with 1,000. And it does it in a loop. And the other thread just access the animals again with the pub function and does it also in a loop. And what happens here if um, that queue is full and all these 100 slots have been used, then the next call to push allocates memory. So it's not really log free anymore because it can take some time to allocate the memory. And that push really never fails because that queue is able to allocate memory whenever it needs some. If I want to change this, if I don't want that there's memory allocated, if I want it to be really log free, then I can change here the queue. In this case, I use another container called SPSC, single producer, single consumer, because I have one thread producing animals and another thread consuming animals. So this is really a more general purpose container if you have multiple threads adding or reading animals. So this is really for scenarios where you have a single producer, a single consumer, otherwise it works exactly the same. And here I'm saying this queue should have a capacity of 100, not more. So if for whatever reason this one thread is a bit faster than the other, and we have pushed 100 animals into that queue, then with the 101 animal push will fail, push will return false, we will exit the while loop. And um, yeah, pop again, it's the very same loop as before. This pop we just access here the queue and pop will always return true if there's more data in the queue and if the queue is empty it will return false. Again, very simple class. Um, you uh, yes, so the question is whether this here will ever fail and this will never fail unless of course you have consumed all memory but um, this push will automatically allocate memory if it sees that these 100 reserved slots are full. Yes. So by default, the queue is not fixed size. 
And that's the one thing maybe you have to think of when you use the log-free containers. Because there is an operation which is not really log-free because it has to access a resource which is shared with other processes. So that example is also not log-free. Once you get to the point where you have to allocate more memory in that operation, it might be more complicated, correct? Um, it is thread-safe in, in a way that the operating system hopefully provides you memory in a thread-safe manner. Okay. So if your process can allocate memory concurrently with other processes, it is thread-safe, so it will not crash. But um, it can, of course, take some time to allocate memory, depending on how your well, allocation um, algorithm works of the operating system. So there's not such a guarantee as you have here, where you know, okay, there are 100 elements, there's no memory allocated, there's a space for it, all the animals are pushed into it, and if it's full, it's full. So Sebastian just mentioned that the animal here, or whatever type you use, must have a trivial copy constructor. And um, in this case, my animal or my example is not correct, because yeah, I'm, even so I don't define the animal class here anymore, I'm just assuming I'm using the animal from the very first slide of this presentation. Yeah. Boost property tree. I think Sebastian can also talk a lot about that uh, library. Um, a very convenient library. Um, it is a tree container with key value pairs. It is, I think, mainly used to load and save configuration data. Um, it supports a couple of file formats. So that tree here, which you can use in that library, can be easily serialized to different file formats. And you can easily load the tree again from different file formats. So the library supports out of the box XML, JSON, INI, and another special property tree format. And what's also interesting, we will see it on the slides, that a container makes it very easily to extract data from anywhere in the tree. The boost-only library again, it's not fixed size, it owns the elements, not thread safe, the validity of iterators and references is not preserved. It can be easily serialized, cannot be shared in a shared memory with boost interprocess, and it's around for quite some time. And have a, let's have a look at how that container is used. I have here my um, property tree. The class is called ptree. I'm storing data now in my property tree. So I have now a zoo in Europe, Amsterdam, with one line. I have another zoo in Europe, Berlin, with an elephant. And you see here that I use that dot here for a reason. You can think of that dot as being a directory separator. So what happens here when I put this key value pair here into the container. There's an, there are new nodes created. And at the top level, we have a Europe node. And on the next level, we have an Amsterdam and Berlin node. And the Amsterdam node is set to line, and the Berlin node is set to elephant. So that is not strictly a map, as you would maybe yeah, think of when you see this. There's something else going on that is really a tree with multiple nodes. And I can then access data directly just the way as I put it in, I can also write down, give me the data at the node Amsterdam, the node Amsterdam will know Europe. I can just use that dot again, the dot notation. But what I can also do, I can say, give me all the children from the Europe node. In this case, these are the Amsterdam and Berlin nodes. And as I always get a key value pair, I write down here the name of the city. First is Amsterdam or Berlin. And here, a second data is the lion or the elephant. What does this data here have to do? I think the first and second one can somehow understand. It's like a pair. But why do I need to call data here? Again, this property tree is a kind of a recursive structure. So what you have here when you have a key, it's most of the time a string. So if you use p tree out of the box, everything is a string. So the key is a string, as you see, and the value is a string. But internally, if you look at the first node, you have the key is a string, and the value of the first node is a property tree container itself. So whenever you access the second part, the other part next to the key, you get another property container. We could then access also again here on a.second, for example, a get child function, 
to get the children of these nodes. So it's a kind of a recursive structure where the key is a string and the value is a property container itself. You have also other containers which you can use out of the box. IP tree, a case insensitive tree. So again, if I put in data like this, it doesn't really matter whether I use capital or lower case letters. But what is maybe the most interesting part of the library, you have some functions to easily serialize a container to a JSON format, for example. You can then load the container from a JSON format again. So it's very easy to store configuration data in a file and to access in this configuration data with this container somehow. So when I hear property tree, I always think of configuration data. Boost multi-array, we're nearly done. It's a container which provides you um, multi-dimensional arrays. The number of dimensions is set at compile time. The extent of the dimensions is set at runtime. If you access the array and use an index, you get a sub-array. But what you can also can do, you can also create views. So you can look at a multi-dimensional array and can cut a part out of it. You can treat then that view as an array of its own. And what is also possible, you can reshape and resize arrays. Boost only, fixed size, of course, it's an array. It owns the elements, not thread safe. Validity of iterators and references is preserved. Cannot be serialized, cannot be put into shared memory and is around since boost 129. Very quick example how it's used. Here you have your multi-array. I want to store <coughs> cars in the array. I want that array to have two dimensions. As I said, number of dimensions is set at compile time. The extents is set at runtime. So the first, extent, uh, the first dimension should have two slots. The other dimension, seven slots. So we can think of that array being a table, two rows, with seven slots in each row. And if I use then an index, like here, to access the first row in my two-dimensional array, I get a sub-array. Uh, maybe I should have used here also the keyword auto. And um, I can then copy, for example, the word hello, comma, into my first row, into my sub-array of that multi-dimensional array. So I get a sub-array if I just use an index to access the array. What I, what I can also do, I can create a view. So in this case, I define exactly which part of the multidimensional area I want to access. And here I'm saying I want to access the second row. And I want to access not all the seven elements in the second row, but only the first six one from zero till six. And then I have a so-called view. And a view behaves again like an area of its own. So again, I can copy something like world into the second row of my multidimensional array. Dynamic bit set, very easy container, works exactly like standard bit set, except that the size is set at runtime. You have a couple of yeah, functions here which you might expect from a container, which is dynamic, resize, pushback, a pushback, and append. You can even set the underlying block type so somewhere the bits must be stored. So it's a long or something else in the dynamic bit set. You can also, of course, change the size at runtime. Yeah, boost only to a certain extent. Yes, I mean, we have a bit set in the standard library, but it's not dynamic. Fixed size, no. It's dynamic after all. It owns elements. Yes, it's thread safe. No, I have deleted this because there are no iterators and there are no references to the bits in a dynamic bit set. It cannot be serialized, cannot be shared in memory. Here, a very simple example how it's used. That bit set here has three bits. I can add another one, a fourth bit. By default, the bits are not set. So here's the fourth bit, which is set. And I can iterate over set bits with find first and find next. I think these are functions we don't have in a standard bit set. Otherwise, a very simple to use class. We can also get bits as a string. There's a toString function. We can get bits as an unsigned long with two ulong. We can check it. We can check for subsets. So we can have a look at whether the one bit set defines all the bits. Another bit set defines. A couple of helpful functions which maybe make sense 
to use dynamic bit set even if you don't need to change the size of a bit set at runtime. Boost heap, priority queues, I will just go quickly through it now. I think it's the last one apart from two other libraries which we have in the C++ standard anyway. So here we have priority queues. Um, I'm pushing a couple of animals into my priority queue. The priorities of these animals depends, of course, on the legs. So the more legs, the higher priority. And um, yeah, I can then, of course, access my animals in the priority queue with a top function. I can remove them with a pop function, just as you know from the standard library already anyway. But what is now more interesting, boost heap defines a hell lot of more classes with different complexities for the various functions provided here by these priority queues. And fortunately, there's again a table in the documentation of boost heap which shows you exactly which complexity which function has. So you can not only use the standard priority queue of that library, there's this one class called priority queue, but you can also use the array heap, binomial heap, Fibonacci heap, and so on. Boost array. I think there's not much I need to talk about, except the same library we have in the C++ 11 standard anyway, and boost unordered. Again, yeah, if you like, you can have a look later, but there's not much to say about. You see it already here, just use the containers from the STL. There's not a big difference between boost unordered and the containers you have in the standard library. If you want some more information, there is the reference to the boost documentation. There's the reference to my online books. And I've seen there are some presentations this week where you can maybe uh, learn a little bit more about containers. There are presentations on Thursday about tuples and fusion. And I think on Friday there's also a presentation which seems to, which seems to have something to do with um, containers where you can store heterogeneous types. Something you can do maybe in other programming languages already but not yet in C++. From what I read on the C++ Now website, this is something which seems to be discussed on Friday. All right, we are more or less done. Uh, it wasn't 50 libraries in 180 minutes, but I still had to hurry a little bit in the end. So I hope you could follow. Otherwise, the presentation will be online on the website anyway. I will send it to Ray. And now enjoy your lunch. All right.